The Cube presents HPE Discover 2022. Brought to you by HPE. Hey everyone, welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of HPE Discover 22, live from the Sands Expo Center in Las Vegas. Lisa Martin here with Dave Vellante. We have an alumni back joining us to talk about high-performance computing and AI. Justin Hotard, EVP and General Manager of HPC and AI at HPE. That's a mouthful, welcome back. It is, no, it's great to be back, and wow, it's great to be back in person as well. It's, it's life-changing to be back in person. <laughs> the keynote this morning was, Great. The, Dave was saying the energy that he's seen is probably the most out of, of any discovery that you've been at, and we've been feeling that, and it's only day one. Yeah, I, I, I agree, and I think it's a testament to the places in the market that we're leading, the innovation we're driving. I mean, obviously the leadership in HP GreenLake and, and enabling as a service for, for every customer, not just those in the public cloud, providing that, that capability. And then obviously what we're doing in HPC and AI, breaking, uh, you know, breaking records and uh, advancing the industry. So. I just saw the Q2 numbers, nice revenue growth there for HPC and AI. Talk to us about the lay of the land, what's going on, what are customers excited about? Yeah, you know, it's it's a it's a really fascinating time in this in this business because we're you know we just we just delivered the first the world's first exascale system, right? And that's uh, you know that's a, a huge milestone for our industry, a breakthrough. You know, 13 years ago we did the first petascale system. Now we're doing the first exascale system. Huge advance forward. But what's exciting too is these systems are enabling new applications, new workloads, breakthroughs in AI. The beginning of being able to do proper quantum simulations, which will lead us to a much you know, brighter future with quantum, and then actually better and more granular models, which have the ability to really change the world. I was telling Lisa that during the pandemic, we did uh, Exascale Day. It was like this co yep. you know, produced event. And we weren't quite at Exascale yet, but we could see it coming, and so it was great to see the Frontier and, and the keynote, you guys broke through that. Is that a natural evolution of HPC, or is this, are we entering a new era? Yeah, I, I think it's a new era, and I think it's a new era for a few reasons, because that, that breakthrough really, it starts to enable a different class of use cases, and it's combined with the fact that I think, you know, you, you look at where the rest of the enterprise's data set has gone, right? We've got a lot more data, a lot more visibility to data, um, but we don't know how to use it. And now with this computing power, we can start to create new insights and new applications. And so I think this is going to be a path to making HPC more broadly available. And of course it introduces AI models at scale. And that's, that's really critical because AI is a buzzword. I mean, lots of people say they're doing AI, but when, you know, to, to build true intelligence, not, not effectively you know, a machine that learns data and then can only handle that data, but to build true intelligence where you've got something that can continue to learn and understand and grow and evolve, you need this class of system. And so I think we're at, we're at the forefront of a lot of exciting innovation. How, in terms of innovation, how important is it that you're able to combine you know, as a service and HPC? Uh, what, what does that mean for, for customers, for experimentation and innovation? You know, a couple of things. I've been. I've actually been talking to customers about that over the last day and a half. And you know, one is um, you think about these. These systems are they're very large and and they're they're pretty you know pretty big bets if you're a customer. So getting early access to them right is is really key. Making sure that they're they can migrate their software, their applications. Again, in our space, most of our applications are custom built. Whether you're a you know a government or a, private sector company that's using these systems, you're, you're doing these are pretty specialized. So getting that early access is important. And then actually what we're seeing is uh, with the growth and explosion of insight that we can enable and some of the diversity of you know, new um, accelerator partners and new processors that are on the market is actually the attraction of diversity. And so making things available where customers can use multimodal systems. And we've seen that in this era, like our customer Lumi in Finland, number, the number three fastest system in the world, actually has two sides to their system. So there's a compute side, dense compute side, and a dense accelerator side. So Oak Ridge National Labs was on stage with Antonio this morning, the, the talking about Frontier, the Frontier system. I thought, what a great name, very apropos. But it was also just named the number one to the supercomputing top 500. That's a pretty big accomplishment. Talk about the impact of what that really means. Yeah, I, I think a couple things. First of all, uh, anytime you have this breakthrough of number one, you see a massive acceleration of applications. And if you really, if you look at the applications that were built, because when the US Department of Energy funded these exascale products or platforms, they also funded 
app, a set of applications. And so it's the ability to get more accurate earth models for long-term climate science. It's the ability to model the electrical grid and understand better how to build resiliency into that grid. This ability is, um, Dr. Tarasi talked about a progressing, you know, cancer research and cancer breakthroughs. I mean, there's so many benefits to the world that we can bring with these systems. That's one element. The other big part of this breakthrough is actually a list, a lesser known list from the top 500 called the Green 500. And that's where we measure performance over power consumption. And what's a huge breakthrough in this system is that not only did Frontier debut at number one on the top 500, it's actually got the top two spots uh, because it's got a small test system that also is up there, but it's got a, the top two spots on the green 500. And that's actually a real huge breakthrough because now we're doing a ton more computation at far lesser power. And that's really important because you think about these systems, ultimately you, can, you can't you know, continue to consume power linearly with scaling up performance. There's, I mean, there's a huge issue on our impact on our environment, but it's the impact to the power grid, it's the impact to heat dissipation, there's a lot of complexity. So this breakthrough with Frontier also enables us, no pun intended, to really accelerate you know, the, the capacity and scale of these systems and what we can deliver. It feels like we're entering a new renaissance of HPC. I mean, I'm old enough to remember, I, it, was, it wasn't until re recently my wife, not recently, maybe five, six years ago, my wife threw out my, my green Thinking Machines t-shirt that Danny Hillis <laughs> gave me. You guys probably both too young to remember, but you had Thinking Machines, Kenda Square Research, Convex tried to mini, build a mini computer HPC. Okay, and there was a lot of innovation going on around that time, and then it just became too expensive, and, and, and other things, the x86 happened, and, and, but it feels like now we're entering a, a new era of, of HPC, is that valid, is it true? What's that mean for HPC as an industry and for industry? Yeah, I think, I think, it's, a, I think it's a breadth, um, it's a market that's opening and getting much more broader. The number of applications you can run, you know, and we've traditionally had, you know, scientific applications, but obviously there's a ton in energy and, and, you know, physics and some of the traditional areas that obviously the Department of Energy is sponsored. But, you know, we saw this with, with even the COVID pandemic, right? Our, our supercomputers were used to identify the spike protein to, to help and uh, validate and test these vaccines and bring them to market in record time. We saw some of the benefits of these breakthroughs. And I think it's this combination of the, that we actually have the data, you know, it's, it's digital, it's captured. Um, we're capturing it at, you know, at the edge, we're capturing it and, and storing it obviously more broadly. So we have the access to the data and now we have the compute power to run it. And the other big thing is the techniques around artificial intelligence. I mean, what we're able to do with neural networks, computer vision, large language models, natural language processing, these are breakthroughs that um, one, require these large systems, but two, as you give them the large systems, you can actually really enable acceleration of how sophisticated these, these applications can get. Let's talk about the impact of the convergence of HPC and AI. What are some of the things that you're seeing now and what are some of the things that we're going to see? Yeah, so, so I, one thing I like to talk about is it's, it's really, it's not, a convergence I think it's, it sometimes gets a little bit oversimplified. It's actually, it's traditional modeling and simulation leveraging machine learning to, to refine the simulation. And this is, a, this is one of the things we talk about a lot in AI, right? It's using machine learning to actually create code in real time rather than humans doing it. That ability to refine the model as you're running. So we have an example, we did a, uh, we, we actually launched an open source solution called SmartSim. And the first application of that was climate science. And it's, what it's doing is it's actually learning the data from the model as the simulation is running to provide more accurate climate prediction. But you think about that, that could be run for, you know, anything that has a complex model. You could run that for financial modeling, you can use AI. And so we're seeing things like that and I think we'll continue to see that. The other side of that is using modeling and simulation to actually represent what you see in AI. So we were talking about the grid. This is one of the exascale compute projects. You could actually use, once you actually get, get the data and you can start modeling the behavior of every electrical endpoint in a city, you know, the, the meter in your house, the substation, the, the transformers, you can start measuring the effects of that. You can then build equations. Well, once you build those equations, you can then take a model because you've learned what actually happens in the real world, build the equation, and then you can provide that to someone who doesn't need a exascale supercomputer to run it, but 
that you know your local energy company can better understand what's happening and they'll know oh there's a problem here we need to shift the grid or respond more, more dynamically and hopefully that avoids brownouts or you know some of the catastrophic outages we've seen so they can deploy that model which which inherently has that intelligence on sort of more cost effective systems and then apply it to a much broader range do any of those um, Smart simulations on, on climate suggest that it's, it's all a hoax. You don't have to answer that question. Um, <laughs> w w what a, w the temperature outside, Dave, might, yeah, yeah, you know, right. might give you a little bit of an argument to that. Tell us about quantum. What's your point of view there? Is it becoming more stable? What's H HPE doing there? Yeah, so, so look, I think there's, there's two things to understand with quantum. There's quantum hardware, right, fundamentally um, how um, how, that runs very differently than, than how we run traditional computers. And then there's the applications. And ultimately, a quantum application on quantum hardware will be far more efficient in the future than, than anything else. We, we see the opportunity for, uh, much like we see with, you know, with HPC and AI we just talked about, for quantum to be complementary. It runs really well with certain applications that fabricate themselves as quantum problems. And some great examples are, you know, the, the life sciences, obviously quantum chemistry. Uh, you see some, actually some opportunities in, in, uh, in AI and, and other areas where uh, quantum has a very, very, it just lends itself more naturally to the behavior of the problem. And what we believe is that in the short term, we can actually model quantum effectively on these, on these supercomputers because there's not a perfect quantum hardware replacement over time you know, we would anticipate that will evolve and we'll see quantum accelerators, much like we see, you know, AI accelerators today in this space. So we think it's going to be a natural evolution and progression, but there's certain applications that are just going to be solved better by quantum. And that's the, that's the future we'll, we'll run into. And you're suggesting, if I understood it correctly, you can start building those applications and, and at least modeling what those applications look like today with today's technology. That's interesting because, I mean, I, I think it's something rudimentary compared to quantum as flash storage, right? When you got rid of the spinning disk, it changed the way in which people thought about writing applications. So if I understand it, new applications that can take advantage of quantum are going to change the way in which developers write not one or a zero, it's one and virtually yep. infinite <laughs> combinations. Yeah, and I actually, I think that's what's compelling about the opportunity is that you can, if you, if you think about a lot of traditional, the traditional computing industry, you always had to kind of wait for the hardware to be there to really write, write and test the application. And we, you know, we even see that with our customers in HPC and, and AI, right? They, they build a model and then they, they actually have to optimize it across the hardware once they deploy it at scale. And with quantum, what's interesting is you can actually, uh, you can actually model and, and, and make progress on the software, and then and then as the hardware becomes available, optimize it. And that's, you know, that's why we see this. We talk about this concept of quantum accelerators as, as really interesting. Mm -hmm. What are the customer conversations these days as there's been so much evolution in HPC and AI and the technology, so much change in the world in the last couple of years? Is it elevating up the C stack in terms of your conversations with customers wanting to become familiar with exascale computing, for example? Yeah, I, I think two things. Uh, one, one is we see a real rise in digital sovereignty and Exascale and HPC as a core fun, you know, fundamental foundation. So you see what, um, you know, what Europe is doing with the, the, the Euro HPC initiative as one example. We, you know, we see the same kind of leadership coming out of the UK with the system we deployed with them in Archer 2. You know, we've got many customers across the globe deploying next generation weather forecasting systems, but everybody feels, they, they understand the foundation of having a strong supercomputing and HPC capability and competence, and not just the hardware, the software development, the scientific research, the, the computational scientists, to enable them to remain competitive economically. It's important for defense purposes. It's important for, you know, for helping their citizens, right, and providing, you know, providing services and, and betterment. So that's one, I'd say that's one big theme. The other one is something Dave touched on before around, you know, as a service and why we think HPE GreenLake will be uh, a beautiful marriage with our, with our HPC and AI systems over time, which is customers also um, are going to scale up and build really complex models, and then they'll simplify them and deploy them in other places. And so there's a number of examples. We see them, you know, we see them in places like oil and gas. We see them in manufacturing where I've got to build a really complex model, figure out what it looks like, then I can reduce it 
to a you know to a uh, certain equation or application that I can then deploy, so I understand what's happening and running. Because you, you of course, as much as I would love it, you're not going to have uh, every enterprise around the world or every endpoint have an exascale system, right? So so that ability to to, to really provide an as a service element with HP GreenLake we think is really compelling. HPE's move into HPC, the acquisitions you've made, it really have become a differentiator for the company, hasn't it? Yeah, and I, and I think what's unique about us today, if you look at the landscape, is we're, we're really the only system provider globally. Yep. You know, there are, there are local players that we compete with, um, but we are the one true global system provider, and we're also the only, I would say the only holistic innovator at the system level to, to, you know, to credit my team on the work they're doing. But you know, we're, we're also very committed to open standards. We're investing in, um, you know, in a number of places where we contribute the, de de the software assets to open source. We're doing work with standards bodies to progress and accelerate the industry and enable the ecosystem. And, uh, and I think that you know, ultimately the, the, the last thing I'd say is we, we are so connected in um, with, through our through the legacy or the, the legend of, H, of Hewlett Packard Labs, which now also reports in me that we have these really tight ties into advanced research, and that some of that advanced research, which isn't just um, around kind of core processing silicon, is really critical to enabling better applications, better use cases, and accelerating the outcomes we see in these systems going forward. Can you double click on that? I, yeah. I, I wasn't aware that it, it kind of reported into your, your group. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, the roots of HP are invent. Right, yeah. HP Labs are, are renowned. It kind of lost that formula for a while, and now it's, it sounds like it's coming back. What 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 are some of the cool things that you guys are working on? Well, you know, let me let me start with a little bit of recent history. So we just talked about the Exascale program. I mean, that was a that's a great example of where we had a public-private partnership with the Department of Energy, and it and it wasn't just that we. Um, you know, we built a system and delivered it, but if you go back a decade ago or five years ago, there were there were innovations that were built you know, to accelerate that system. One is our slingshot fabric as an example, which is a mm. core enable of, of, acceler you know, of, of this accelerated computing environment, but others in software applications and services that allowed us to, you know, to really deliver a, a complete solution into the market. Um, today we're looking at things around trustworthy and ethical AI. So trustworthy AI in the sense that you know the models are accurate, you know, and that's that's a challenge on two dimensions, because one is the model's only as good as the data it's studying, so you need to validate that the data is accurate, and then you need to really study how you know how do I make sure that even if the data is accurate, I've got a model that then you know is going to predict the right things and not call a, a dog a cat or a you know, a, a cat, a mouse, or whatever that is. But the, so that's important, and uh, so that's one area. The other is future system architectures, because um, as we've talked about before, Dave, you have this constant tension between the fabric, uh, you know, the, the interconnect, the compute, and the and the storage, and you know, balancing you're constantly, constantly yeah. balancing it. And so we're l really looking at that. How do we do more, you know, shared memory access? How do we you know, how do we do more direct writes? Like, you know, looking at some future system architectures and thinking about that. And we, you know, we think that's really, really critical in this part of the business because these heterogeneous systems, and not saying I'm going to have one monolithic application, but I'm going to have applications that need to take advantage of different code, different technologies at different times, and being able to move that seamlessly across the architecture, uh, we think is going to be the, you know, a part of the, the hallmark of the Exascale era. Including Edge which is a completely different animal. I think that's where some disruption is going to, going to bubble up here in the next decade. So. Yeah, I know, and, and that's, you know, that's the last thing I'd say is, is we look at AI at scale, which is another core part of the business that can run on these large clusters. That means getting all the way down to the edge and doing inference at scale, right? Yeah. And, and inference at scale is, you know, I, I was, um, about a month ago, I was at the World Economic Forum. We were talking about the space economy, and it's a great, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's the perfect example of inference because if you get a set of data that you know is is out at Mars, yeah. it doesn't matter whether you know whether you want to push all that data back to uh, to Earth for processing or not. You don't really have a choice because it's just going to take too long. Don't have that time, Justin. Thank you so much for spending some of your time with Dave and me talking about what's going on with HPC and AI. The frontier just seems endless and very exciting. We appreciate your time on your insights. Great, thanks so much. Thanks, Jeff. And don't call a dog a cat. That I, that I learned from you. Hot dog I, or no? Nope, nope. <laughs> <laughs> For Justin and Dave Vellante, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching theCUBE's coverage of day one from HPE Discover 22. The Cube is, guess what, the leader. The leader in live tech coverage. We'll be right back with our next guest. <laughs>